4. And we're going to look down at verse 5 and read from there to the end of the chapter. I, I, I said chapter 4, but I meant to say chapter 3. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. And we'll go from verse 5 down to the end of the chapter. For this cause, when I could no longer forbear, I said to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter, having tempted you in our labor, be in vain. But now when Timothy came from you unto us and brought us good tidings of your faith and charity, and that ye have good remembrance of us always, desiring greatly to see us, as we also to see you, therefore, brethren, we were comforted over you in all our affliction and distress by your faith. For now we live, if ye stand fast in the Lord. For what thanks can we render to God again for you, for all the joy wherewith we joy for your sakes before our God? Night and day, praying exceedingly that we might see your face, and might perfect that which is lacking in your faith. Now God Himself, and our Father, and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way unto you. And the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another, and toward all men, even as we do toward you. To the end, he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. New paragraph. Let's pray. Lord, please help us this evening from your word from the scripture to see encouraging words and examples that we could follow and I pray that as clear as we could see them from the Scripture, Lord, that we would be principled in our hearts to follow the things that we know to be best and right. And we praise you in Jesus' name for that. Amen. Literally, this could be the end of the letter because Paul is finished saying to the church at Thessalonica a great deal of material. He's made a statement that... Basically, the news that he's heard from Thessalonica has not only allayed his fears, but it has provided him personal comfort and joy despite his circumstances. And that everything that he's heard about the church at Thessalonica is good. If you were to read chapter 1, you'd see a warm greeting. And you would see the mention that Paul makes that the faith of the Thessalonian church is spoken of throughout the whole world and that they are mentioned and used by Paul for examples of faith. And one of the churches he mentions that they're a good example for is the church at, the, at uh, Macedonia, which is used, do you remember, in the, for the church of Corinthian, at Corinth's example for grace or giving. And so, this church at Thessalonica is one of those places when Paul thinks of the ministry there, one of those places that you kind of have the, you know, the good awe feeling, you know, when you hear good news and it, it, it warms your heart, it thrills you, and you just like to think about it, and it's just, you know, I'm one of these people that when, when there's something good, I want to make sure everybody knows it's good. And I want to keep talking about it. I want to keep saying, hey, this is wonderful, isn't it? Isn't this great? And you say, yeah, it's great. Okay, a minute later, I'm like, hey, this is great, isn't it? And you're like, yeah, yeah, it's great. Yeah, you, you, know, you, know, you mentioned that. You think it's great. It's great, isn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah. No, yeah, it's great. Yeah. I want people to know it's great. And this is the way Paul is about the church at Thessalonica. And literally, uh, he does not continue the flow of thought through the letter. A lot of letters that the Apostle Paul writes carry a continuous thought flow, thought pattern. But this is one that the next word is furthermore. In other words, it's additionally, which means this is all one part of the letter, and now I'm going, it's almost like he writes a second part of the letter in 1 Thessalonians. You see that? 
You see it from you see it in the text. If you were to outline it, if you were to take and and just show the the con, the uh, connections between the sentences and the paragraphs, you'd see that this is a break. Okay. Now, chapter three to the church at Thessalonica mentions some things that are really good about uh, the church at Thessalonica. You remember who that they are? Do you remember that? Right after Paul and Silas had been beaten and imprisoned in Philippi, and the Philippian jailer had gotten saved, they'd been sort of run out of town. They came to Thessalonica, and the Bible says for three Sabbath days. They'd gone in the synagogues, and they contended for the faith there. And a lot of people had believed, but you know the, the Jewish mafia uh, ran them out of town. And they actually had him arrested. I'm serious. <laughs> if you look at it, it was uh, one of this baser men of the loot sort, which is a uh, Jewish mafia. Is what it was. They they suborned men or they hired men, and uh, they had him locked up, had him arrested, and they made a man by the name of Jason basically post a bond for them, post bail for them, and then the brethren sent him out of town. Literally. The church at Thessalonica at that stage was a three-week-old church. I don't know about you, but three weeks, a lot can happen in three weeks, but three weeks isn't very long. Much can happen, but three weeks isn't very long. Let me, let me uh, just mention some things, though, that, to give us a perspective for the three weeks. In the synagogues, the people who would have turned to faith in Jesus Christ would have been individuals that would have known the Scripture. The ones who would have been honest about what the Scripture says. You know, in, in literally in the days of Jesus Christ, the people who actually knew the Scripture received Jesus. You could say, well, there would be some exceptions. For instance, when the wise men came, do you remember when they came to Jerusalem? and they asked where the Messiah would be, and they knew where the Messiah would be in Bethlehem of Judea. Uh, and those individuals didn't believe. But keep in mind, there were people that did go to Bethlehem, besides the wise men, that did believe. Most people that knew the Scripture, and I mean more than just quote, could quote the Scripture, but actually understood it, they became believers. A multitude of people are described as having gone out from Jerusalem and Judea and all the regions about uh, Judea to John the Baptist to be baptized at the time of Christ. So there are a lot of people that did believe in Jesus. And then, uh, of course, there would have been a lot of people in Jerusalem who would have been believers in Jesus. And some of those perhaps could have gone to Thessalonica. So the assumption that the church at Thessalonica doesn't have any believers in it or part of it that are older than three weeks, I think that would not necessarily be completely accurate. But generally speaking, it's a three-week-old church. It's three weeks old. And so Paul, at the beginning of chapter 3 in 1 Thessalonians, spends a good bit of time discussing the concerns that he had for them. And he said, you know, we wanted to come in chapter 2. We wanted to come and check up on you guys. And we were let hitherto. We weren't, we weren't able to. He said, so then when we could no longer forbear, we sent Timothy, Timothy's, so that he could check on you. And then he said, and boy, did he ever have some great things to say. Y'all are doing perfect. That's a great church. A solid church. Without us, you're doing well. And I praise God for that. I want to ask a question this evening, and I want to kind of just approach a topic that um, has been, a, a, as long as I've been in the ministry, has been a burden on my heart. Been something that I've thought, you know, this is something that really needs to be in any church that is pastored. This is a part of pastoring or a part of being a part of success, I would say, in the ministry. Now, I want to qualify that by saying, if we're going to say that because the other churches weren't like the church of Thessalonica, then that reflects poorly on Paul, that wouldn't be accurate, would it? wouldn't be right to say, well, you know, at the church at Thessalonica, I mean, three weeks and they were established, they were solid, and they, they were just a good church. You know, uh, so Paul was a good apostle in Thessalonica, but he was lousy in Philippi. 
or he wasn't so good in Corinth. Actually, he was in Corinth for years. And they had more problems in the letter written to them. Think of that. And Paul administered more there. Maybe we need a little less Paul in order to... So you get it? That's not my point this evening. What I'm saying is that in spite of the way that God used the Apostle Paul at basically the same point in his ministry, different people responded differently. And so, as a pastor, I'm not an apostle, but as a pastor, I'm responsible for the spiritual well-being of our church. Have the oversight of it. Have the oversight of and responsibility for the spiritual well-being, not only of individuals, but the overview, the overall outlook of our church. But I do want to say that there is a certain degree where if our church doesn't do well spiritually, it has to do more with how people respond to the minister or the servant than to how the minister serves. We have some wise sayings in our vocabulary, things like the church is like its pastor. I said it to Pastor Nick the other day. I can't remember what he was telling me about. Something that was... Something about his people. I said, well, the people are like their pastor. You know, that's a wise saying. It's, it's generally true, isn't it? You say, Pastor, I hope not. No, you're exactly like me. When I see you, I see myself. <laughs> so you could have gone all day without saying that. Uh, well, whatever. Uh, it's just a wise saying. It really isn't actually true. It doesn't make you what you're supposed to be or make you not what you're supposed to be. I have, though, seen, let me, let me just be as, as blunt and I'll ask a question and I would like to look at it scripturally. I have seen churches change when they lose leadership. Actually, usually churches change when they, when they lose their leadership. By lose the leadership, I mean by either the pastor being moved on by the Lord or by the pastor being taken or by something terrible happening. I've seen churches during the transition become different than they were before. The church at Thessalonica is a model of a church that in three weeks time was established and that years later was still what they were founded to be. They hadn't changed in a good way. I want to ask a practical question. I want us to, and I, and, if you want to be mean or critical, don't answer this evening. But I want to ask a, a practical question. What are some ways that our church ought to change? What are some ways that this ministry ought to change? Okay, we ought to grow. Yeah, We ought to stop being uh, ineffective in reaching our community. I'll change in that way. I'll be more effective in reaching our community. Okay, so we got to grow. What else? There should be new people who can do teaching and things. So we ought to have we ought to have more leadership. We ought to, we ought to have more leadership. Yeah, ought to be seeing people rise into leadership positions. Yeah. Okay. What else? Does anybody but Lee have any? <laughs> Charlie? Um, well, we've seen this since our beginning somewhat, but maybe not to the degree that probably, I guess, maybe the Lord would want, but like our younger kids and teens, that they have a heart and a passion for, um, you know, spiritual. Well, in other words, they... Well, they have they, a greater pa spiritual passion. Yeah. You got to be more passionate spiritually. <clears throat> Particularly in our young folks, because old people shouldn't be passionate. Well, they all should. But oh, everybody should be. I'm just qualifying what you qualified, so <laughs> making sure we we're on the same bent there. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Thank you, Charlie. I agree. We give more. Okay, we should give more. We should be. Monetary-wise, the time as well. Yeah, we should give more. We should be more of a giving church. Okay, we could go and we could go through a list of things that if this church were to change, we could list some things that would not be bad changes, couldn't we? In other words, if some things changed about our ministry, there would be some things that 
wouldn't be bad. Okay. Uh, what would be some bad changes for our church? Okay, so for the gospel to become less emphasized, less of an em emphasis. Okay. To not have a heartbeat to preach the gospel. What else? Okay, so stop using stop using uh, the, the the scripture that reflects that we believe in preservation and authority. You know, the the people make a big deal out. They say KJV, and when they do that, that becomes a major distraction because what they really need to say is we believe in Bible authority. Because I know people that are KJV that don't believe in Bible authority. You know, mm -hmm. they, they rant about the Bible, but you can show them truth in the Scripture and it won't change what they believe. You know, so Bible authority. You know, if God says it, I believe it, that settles it. That attitude, that shouldn't change in our church, should it? should be the Scripture settles us on what we believe and think. Okay? What else? What? Okay. Yeah. Our church should not stop having three services a week. This has been really clearly impressed on me. I think that, that it takes three to thrive doesn't explain well enough why churches need to hold more services and not less. I think it just is, ought to be explained that the world constantly attacks and tries to shape our thinking and the fellowship, the church, the preaching, the teaching, the place for that ought to have a fair shake at influencing us. Our church ought to be more influential, not less. Why do we have three services a week? Because we want to influence people more, not less. You say, Pastor, but you know, here's, here's the argument. I, I hear the, I've heard this, I heard this recently from a respected by me, seasoned pastor, and he basically told me that the reasons that he uh, continues to have a Sunday night service are because of somebody that he values that wants to hold it. But it's not a well-attended service. And so if it were up to him, he'd actually cancel the service. And so what I thought was, okay, so you think the reason you have your Sunday service is because you have a good attendance. In other words, we determine what we do on the basis of popular vote, not on the basis of value. Listen, if there's one person here on Wednesday night and they grow because of the preaching of the Word of God, we need to do it. Amen. Listen, everybody ought to be here. But I'm not going to hold a Wednesday night service or not hold a Wednesday night service on the basis of popularity. I'm going to do it because the people need it. And if they ever get to the place where they care about what they need, they'll have a place to go. That makes sense? Ought to. In other words, there are people that could be helped tonight by what I'm preaching. And they sh ought to be helped tonight by what I'm preaching, but they're not because they aren't here. But that has nothing to do with you. You are here. And it's a struggle for pastors not to preach to the people that are there about the people that aren't there. But actually, uh, I want to preach to you. You're here. And if it's one of you, or ten of you, or twenty, or fifty, whatever it is, needs to be done. So not do less, do more in the ministry. It is popular, it was popular a couple of years ago to say, you know, we need to have better quality and less quantity in the ministry. Well, I think we need to have quality and quantity in the ministry. See, that was a cop-out. That was, that was a lame excuse for doing less, for laziness. Let me ask you a question. A pastor who only pastors one church and only holds one service a week. What does he do? What's the guy do? I do all his counseling for him. <laughs> I do. I do all his count. I take all his phone calls. These churches around here that have one service a week, you think they call their pastor when they need counsel? Well, I don't know, but a lot of them call me. They don't come here, but they call me when they need help with their marriage or they need someone to uh, uh, do a funeral or whatever, uh, when they need me, they call me. What do those guys do? Nobody knows. <laughs> their people don't know and nobody thinks to question them, I don't think. 
but uh, they need to they need to get a job, and they, <laughs> I hope they don't get paid. Unfortunately, I know differently. Okay. All right. What else should change if our leadership changes? Way of preach the Bible. They doctrine. Say, yeah. Yeah, doctrine. Our doctrine shouldn't change. This church began because of doctrinal distinctives, things that are not the same. We began because of what we believe about scriptural authority and the script copy of the scripture that we use. We better not change that or this church won't have the reason to exist that it had to begin. Uh, our doctrine shouldn't change because it's the Word of God that's taught and if we teach something differently, then we'll be teaching a different gospel. Okay, those things oughtn't to change. Let me ask you a practical question, though. How often when leadership changes do churches change in major ways? They change their Bible, they change their music. I don't know what the percentage is, but it's uh, pretty nip and tuck. When I see a leadership change, I usually think there went that church. With some exceptions. I have seen... Pastors turn over the ministry to a predecessor and stay in the church and seeing the next guy really take the church in the same direction but a whole in just a better way. I've seen leadership come in. I've seen the church continue its trajectory but just really take off. I've also seen um, leadership change where a pastor turns over the ministry to someone else and well, I mean, it's like, okay, we've always wanted to change this. And they just had a completely different direction. Um, it isn't really about the organizational success of that. That's not my point this evening because some things that could change that would be good would be growth. Some things that could change that would be good would be to preach the gospel more. Some things that could change that would be good would be to reach more people. Those things would be good for leadership to grow up and take responsibility. That'd be good. But I just want to ask you a question. Who determines the direction that this church goes sans Ryan Price? I always wonder about that. What if I get squashed next week? What happens to our church? I guess we ordain Mrs. Price. She does all the work anyway. <laughs> She'll leave. If something happens to me, my wife will leave this church. She'll be gone. What happens to this church if my wife and I are gone? It's an important question, isn't it? Who would make the decisions, the determinations about what would happen to this church if my wife and I were gone? We all know, don't we, Charlie and Lee? Well, Lee would, because Charlie would be late. <laughs> You say, Pastor, why are you asking that question? Well, because I want us to think about where leadership comes from and what happens when there's a vacuum that is a place that's not filled. See, a vacuum gets filled, doesn't it? You think there wouldn't be a lot of people that would like to step in and take over this place? If there's a vacuum, you don't, you think there wouldn't be somebody that calls and say, "Hey, I'll come do pulpit supply. I'll come whatever, whatever." You think there would be a, wouldn't be a vacuum? There there wouldn't be, my friend. Or there would there would certainly be a vacuum, and it would certainly be filled, hundred percent. So let me ask you a practical question: Who should fill the vacuum? There actually ought to be one. Really, ought to be much of one. I was taught when I was going into the ministry a couple of things that I think are false. One thing I was told was, 
When a pastor steps down, matter of fact, I have a dear friend in the ministry who believes this so strongly, somehow it comes up in every conversation we have. But whenever a, a pastor steps down from the ministry, he should leave. I was taught that. That way, the people don't follow him. They follow the new pastor, and he turns over the reins of the leadership. And I'll just be honest with you, I think that's silly. It's silly because I've watched pastors try and do that, and I've seen it's not possible. In other words, if people aren't willing to see that the pastor is not who they follow, they're following Jesus, and if he leaves, they'll just leave with him. Or they'll just go out of the church with him. You guys remember Don Nelson? What happened? What happened when he came to the twilight years of his ministry? What happened? When he left the church, people left with him. When he handed over the ministry, um, he didn't like the new pastor, and he took it back. Took the ministry back. You know, people he, people followed him very, 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 very strongly, very, very um, actively. And today, Don Nelson has been dead how many years? Does anybody know? Like 20 years? His 90s, right? 93? When did he die? Maybe about 20. About 20 years. Maybe more than 20 years. I think it's been more than 20 years. Anyway, he's been gone for more than 20 years. And today people don't go to church because they still follow Don Nelson. I'm not kidding you. There are people that are not members of church. Churches, they're still staying at home because, well, Don Nelson was my pastor and I just never could find a pastor after Don Nelson. In other words, there's a vacuum that was left because people followed him instead of following Jesus. Mm. <laughs> Serious. You, I mean, there's people, you know, Don Nelson. I'm not going to tell you who they are, but you know them. If I mention them, you, I, could, I could mention people you know. And they still, I mean, it's today, you want to talk to them about, you ought to serve God. Well, I served under Don Nelson. You know, they're not serving anymore. But I served under Don Nelson. Well, that has nothing to do with that, you know, He's not responsible for what those people do today. But I'm just saying, if people are going to follow a leader instead of Jesus, they're going to follow a leader instead of Jesus, whether he's present or absent. You get my drift? Do you understand the point I'm making? Whereas if people are following Pastor Price instead of following Jesus, then if Pastor Price goes to another state, they might move. You guys remember Campus Church when Pastor Shetler and Pastor Redland and uh, Pastor Kramer moved away? Everybody on staff moved to uh, Fort Collins, Colorado with uh, Pastor Redland. Everybody that worked with him. His church is still full of PCC people. Yeah, Pastor Redland, okay, he left with Pastor Redland. I'm not saying that's a problem, but what happens if he dies? You know, are they going to quit going to church? Uh, don't take that the wrong way. They probably wouldn't, but they, they liked his leadership, evidently, and they followed him. Pastor Shetler went to Santa Maria, California, and I bet you 100 people followed him out there. I don't know how many, but I'll bet it was 100 people that moved from campus church, and which is fine. It was a transition time in their life, and they, they liked, he was a great leader, and they followed him. And um, they, that's what people do a lot of. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing. Now, this is, some people followed uh, me here to Fort Lauderdale to plant this church. It's not that's, that My point isn't that you, know, you shouldn't be under authority or that you shouldn't follow God's man or God's leader. But you, what are you going to do when that person's gone? What happens when there's a vacuum? What happens? The second thing that I heard uh, was when I was uh, training for ministry that I heard a lot of times from a lot of different preachers was that you should try to work yourself out of a job. In other words, and you, the other thing too was that Everybody's replaceable. You may ever heard this? Don't think you're not replaceable. Everybody's replaceable. You know, a couple of years ago it occurred to me that if I were replaceable, I'm unnecessary. In other words, if it doesn't matter whether I'm there, I need to have the attitude of, you know what, I don't need to feel like I'm important to this ministry because if I weren't here, anybody could step in and fill my shoes and do every bit as good a job as I'm doing and uh, perhaps better. And so what I think that statement is, 
Maybe I better get out of the way and let someone who's better step into the place. And a couple of years ago, it occurred to me that God isn't playing silly games by making us and calling us to serve Him. That He actually has a specific plan and will for our lives. And that if I don't do and I don't serve the way God has made me to serve Him, then there are things that won't be done because my life isn't pointless. My life actually has purpose. That's a stupid statement. And again, you guys know why I can say stupid, right? Everybody knows? Okay. Hope you know. Don't you be saying it unless you're a pastor. All right. Uh, that really is terrible, terrible thinking, isn't it? You, you think about it. Listen, are you replaceable? No, you're not. If you were replaceable, you'd be dead. God made you for a purpose. And if you won't be what God made you to be, you're not accomplishing what God made you for. Listen, the idea, it's Calvinism that says, God's will will be done whether His servants serve or not. That's Calvinism. It's Calvinistic theology and it's not right. If I honestly believe that, I wouldn't preach the gospel. People are going to get saved. They're going to get saved. Now, I believe God's merciful. If a person has a heart to believe, God isn't going to let my ineptitude or my unwillingness to preach the gospel to them keep someone else from doing it. I want to tell you something. <laughs> if it isn't, there isn't a point in my preaching the gospel, then why preach it? If people are going to get saved anyway. You know, most Christians are checking out of serving God because they believe that nonsense. That it doesn't matter if I serve God or not, God's will will be done anyway. And most Christians believe that. You inquire. You start asking questions. You'll, you'll find out most Christians think it doesn't matter actually if they serve God or not. It only matters for them. It doesn't matter for anyone else. The Bible says, No man liveth unto himself, and no man dieth unto himself. Your life matters. You affect people around you. And if you didn't, there wouldn't be a need for you to exist. God created you for a reason and for a divine purpose, and you'll fulfill it or you won't. And the idea that anybody can step into any position and do it the same as the person that God made for it. Listen, you need to be passionate enough about serving God. You need to be convinced enough about the place that you're called to to realize that I was created for this. I was made for this. This is what I was made for. You say, Pastor, do you really believe you are made to be pastor of Fort Lauderdale Baptist Church? You bet your life I do. I sure do. I wouldn't have the audacity to try to plant a church in a city like this, in a place so far from where I am from, if I didn't believe I was made for it. I've had people call me and say, would you consider coming to be our pastor? And I've said, I'm not made to do that. I'm made to be in Fort Lauderdale. I believe with all my heart passionately believe I was made for this. You think there are people that are made to be leadership in our church? Are there people that are made for, for this church? Made for this time? Made for positions and places? Do you think there are people God made for this ministry? Are there? Or is it just kind of whoever shows up, God will just kind of shuffle it up and, you know, and if nobody does anything, it'll still happen anyway. No. God made you. If He didn't make you to be in this church, you better be in the one He made you for. You're not supposed to be here. You better be where you're supposed to be. But you're supposed to be somewhere serving. See? And the question that I ask this evening as I look at this example of the church at Thessalonica is what made it so that Paul and the apostles could be snatched from the city, from the church, and the church still functioned in such a way that their faith and their testimony was an example all around the world? What made it that way? The people, the people at Thessalonica made it that way. In other words, right from the get-go, these are people that aren't saying, well, you know what, we're going to see what the apostles do and see if we want to follow their leadership. These are people that said, yeah, you know what, we're a church. 
And this is our job, this is our duty, this is our responsibility. They never felt as though we have to have the apostles carry out the form and function of this local church. So this is our church. They took ownership instantly. Do you see this? These are people that continued to preach the gospel when the gospel couldn't be preached by the apostles. It's a church that continued to grow to take steps forward in their faith even when the apostles were no longer present. They weren't physically there. This is a church that instead of diminishing when their leadership was pulled away, increased. I've seen it a few times. I've seen it where a church suddenly loses a pastor and you think, boy, and I mean under bad circumstances where you know it's, it hurts the church. And I've seen churches actually grow during those times. How does a church grow when they lose their leadership? The same way they were growing when they still had the leadership. See, if a church is growing and you take a leader out, people that are growing are still going to grow. They're just going to step into the void. There's not going to be a vacuum. And so here's what I believe about leadership in a ministry. I believe a pastor is important because God wouldn't have one if there weren't. Don't you? You think it's important to have a pastor? I hope you think it's important to have a pastor. Uh, and I also believe that a pastor isn't irreplaceable. Don't you? Don't you believe that a pastor could be replaced? I want to tell you something. I shudder at the thought of it. Not because I'm worried about being replaced in this ministry. I'm not at all. I'll be okay wherever I'm at. I shudder at the thought of it because I see pastors being replaced by men who are inept, who take a church the wrong direction, who diminish the doctrine, the preaching, and the teaching of the Word of God and focus on things that are worldly instead of things that are spiritual. I see that happens more times than not. Matter of fact, I would say that most churches, generally speaking, are in decline. Generally speaking. And so I worry. Oh, I shouldn't say worry, but it's a matter when I'm asked what, a, what would happen that I say, well, I don't know. Here's a question. If pastor died, would you follow the leadership that's already in place? at Fort Lauderdale Baptist Church? If your leadership at Fort Lauderdale Baptist Church, should people follow you? Could you take the responsibility and the direction and the trajectory and could you actually move forward and take an actual step forward? Well, I think that could happen, don't you? But you know the only way to know whether that would happen? is if it's happening already. It ought to be happening already. In other words, you ought to be already growing the church like you're responsible for growing the church. How many times have you thought, you know, a pastor's not doing a very good job because this church hasn't grown? That's what I think when our church doesn't grow. I think pastor's not doing a very good job because this church isn't growing. But how many times do you personalize that statement and say, you know what, I'm letting down a little bit. I'm not growing this church. Are you growing this ministry? Are you growing in this ministry? And are you growing this ministry? That's a good question, isn't it? See, pastor could evaluate you just as much as you could evaluate him. The Apostle Paul actually could take very little credit for the growth at Thessalonica, isn't it so? I mean, he found and established the church. He was thankful that they were still loyal to him as their apostle. He was thrilled. He literally was rejoicing. It literally made prison fun for him knowing that a church was thriving in Thessalonica. That's how he phrased it. Like, I'm loving it here in jail because you're doing so well. Read, the, read carefully the end of the chapter when he describes how overjoyed he is at how well that ministry is doing. He said, hey, I'm in prison, but it's all good because you're all good and that's what matters to me. And if you're doing fine, then I don't mind being here. It's 
So what happens when there's a vacuum in leadership? I think we could safely say the answer would be the same that happens when there isn't a vacuum in leadership. Wouldn't that be true? In other words, a church that's doing well and thriving isn't doing well and thriving simply because they have good leadership. It's doing well and thriving because the people are doing well and thriving. And they're part of the leadership. In a church, when there's a vacuum in leadership that declines, isn't declining because there's a vacuum in leadership. It's declining because it wasn't doing well before. And you know, to some degree, I've realized as a pastor that that isn't really something I can determine any more than Paul could determine that the church at Corinth would do well or wouldn't, the church at Philippi would do well or wouldn't, the church at Ephesus would do well or wouldn't, and I could go on and on. Because the reality of it is, is that the way that the church was doing was actually up to the people there and how they responded to what they were given. And we see the church at Thessalonica given very little in terms of time and attention and development from the apostles. We see the church at Corinth being given a lot in terms of time and attention and development from the apostles. And we actually see the church at Thessalonica being spoken of much better as an example for what a church ought to be. And we see the church at Corinth spoken of very poorly as an example for problems that are in a church. And we can't say that Paul caused the problems. We can simply say that the people responded differently. How's your heart? How's your response? Would you rather blame than own responsibility? Would you rather someone else lead than you step up and take leadership? Who should lead this ministry? Who should help us to go forward and to do the things that would make us a better ministry than we are? Who should? We should. Oh, every one of us. We all ought to. And I hope in the next couple of uh, years, I hope to be reminded by the Spirit of God to remind our church of our unified responsibility, our personal responsibility to be what we're supposed to be. You're the kind of Christian that when there's a need you say somebody ought to, or you're the kind of Christian that when there's a need you say, I wonder if God showed me that because I ought to. Sometimes I'm careful not to think over needs to carefully because I'm like, oh, that'll add something to my schedule if, uh, if I'm supposed to do that. I'm kidding about that. But, you know, when things occur to you, I love what my wife always says, says a need seen is a task assigned. We need more of that if we're going to be more effective for Jesus, don't we? Who ought to be growing in their faith? Who ought to be an example for the believers? Who ought to be moving forward? and doing more for Jesus Christ in 2018. We-ins. Us-ins. Father, thank you for the simple truth that we learned this evening. I pray that you would increase it in our minds and our hearts. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so we'll take some prayer requests. Uh, pray for...